Michael Reeves, who is a professor of theology at Union School of Theology in the UK, published a terrific book last year titled Rejoice and Tremble, The Surprising Good News of the Fear of the Lord. And the book addresses that biblical expression, some of you have heard it, the fear of the Lord, describing how, when understood on biblical terms and not our own, the fear of the Lord is not so much the terror of the Lord as it is a trembling affection for the Lord, akin to holding a newborn for the first time. And some of you remember this. Some of you are experiencing it. Hello, Colton and Chelsea. You have never been so terrified of and yet so head over heels in love with a person in your entire life. That's the fear of the Lord. But before examining that concept, and the book is really about that, Reeves spends a couple of chapters discussing fear in general. He writes at the beginning of chapter 2, quote, We all know fear. When you experience fear, your body reacts. You feel adrenaline release as your heart races. Your breathing accelerates. Your muscles tense. And your brain goes hyper alert. End quote. Now, Reeves acknowledges that sometimes this kind of fear can be fun. Like the fear of riding a roller coaster. That rush as you go down the first big drop. But, sometimes, he continues, quote, it can come as a terrifying amygdala hijack, as panic grips you so utterly that you cannot but only shake, sweat, and fret. End quote. We all know that fear. You know that fear. And we'll touch on this more a little later, but you've likely brought some of those fears with you today. Our current culture is often described as, you've heard it, some of you have said it, a culture of fear. A label that's become something of a cliche, but which is accurate, nevertheless. So much of our current public discourse is fear-oriented. As talking heads fret about the likes of terrorism, extreme weather patterns, pandemic and political turmoil. Indeed, in the political realm, Reeves comments, quotes, we routinely see fear rhetoric used by politicians who recognize that fear drives voting patterns, end quote. And the stats are there to back it up, folks. Fear is so present in our culture and in your minds that politicians know that the best way to garner your support is to stoke those fears. And we often, and unfortunately, prove that theory right. The digital age hasn't helped us any either. We have broader and faster access to causes for worry than ever. Tragic news that 60 years ago would never have reached you is now available to you with the swipe of a thumb. Just think about the kind of anxiety you subject yourself to all in the interest of quote-unquote staying informed. And these are just large-scale fears. Consider your own private ones. Each hamburger brings you one step closer to a heart attack. But be careful, be careful, because that low-calorie diet you've decided to go on could very well be carcinogenic. I'm discovering how easy it is to become paranoid as a parent. In those early days, you check the monitor constantly. Is she breathing? Is it okay for her to sleep at that angle? Is her head going to get flat? What if that animal suffocates her? And it only gets worse as they age. Reeves continues, quote, the valid but usually overblown fear of the kidnapper lurking online or outside every school has helped fuel the rise of teachers, close your ears, helicopter parenting, and children more and more are fenced in to keep them safe. I don't want to pick on universities, but just think of the very fact, political implications notwithstanding, that in some state-funded schools they have to create so-called safe spaces for the kids. Now, before you scoff at those kids, let this millennial tell you that's your fault. 
You fenced us in our entire lives. Did you, are you surprised that we were offended by the notion of the things that contradicted our worldview challenging us? I'll take my lumps for saying that after the sermon. Like we invented the participation trophy. Now the irony in all of this is that as a society, we've never been safer, ever. Humans live longer and recover from more. A prescription of antibiotics enables us to recover from illnesses that in days past would have wiped out counties. It's incredible to think that for as much as we've joked that it would happen, and as much as in some instances we've thought that it would happen, there has not to this day, to, to this day been a third world war. That's incredible. Think how close the first two were to each other. And there hasn't been a third. All things considered, and I realize this is a sermon, not an hour-long lecture, that I am painting with broad strokes here. We are more prosperous and secure than most of humanity before us. And yet to quote Reeves one last time, quote, protected like never before, we are skittish and panicky like never before, end quote. We feel hemmed in behind and before by terror and uncertainty. Fear occupies our, occupies our minds and governs most of our decision making. We, better than any, understand why the Bible's most frequently command is, most frequently given command is, you guessed it, do not fear. This morning, that central command of Scripture converges with the central person of Scripture. In something of a transitional story, John offers his account of Jesus walking on the water to meet his disciples. Here, the Gospel of John's grandest point is presented at the most personal level. Jesus Christ, the eternal Word who was with God and who was God, not only enters into the darkness of the world in general, but enters into yours and my fears in particular, reminding us of who he is, comforting us with his presence, and enabling us to say with the psalmist that because God is very present, even though the waters roar and foam, we will not fear. If you have your Bibles and would like to keep up there, our scripture this morning is John chapter 6, verses 6 through 21, though it is available to you on your screen. John writes, When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, I am. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the crowd from the previous passage, those 5,000 men and their families, has dissipated. They've been sent home. It's evening, and the disciples have gone down to the sea and boarded their boat. And as they set out for what is about a five- or six-mile journey to Capernaum, darkness settles in. And John writes, somewhat ominously, Jesus has not yet come to them. In the prior passage, if you have your Bibles open, just look at the verse above it. Jesus has withdrawn to a mountain by himself, presumably to pray. So we don't know what compelled the disciples to set out without him. Jesus may have told them, he often did, but John doesn't tell us. What John wants us to know is that the disciples are alone. Jesus, at least as far as they can perceive it, is not with them. 
And that sense of Jesus' absence is only deepened by what follows. Trouble surrounds the disciples. The waves become rough because a strong wind was blowing. And the Greek word for strong in that case is megas. So these were not just strong winds afflicting the disciples. These were literally mega winds stirring the waters, shaking the boat, threatening to throw the disciples overboard and be consumed by the sea. The ocean is capable of producing a special kind of fear in a person. Some of you know what I mean. When you're on a boat being thrown around by rough waters, you can't get your feet under you. You feel imbalanced, helpless. Your stomach aches, and it soon becomes clear, if it wasn't clear already, that you are at the ocean's mercy. And in that realization, you pray to God that come what may, you remain on the boat, because if you fall in those waters, you've got no idea what's under you. And remember, this is happening to the disciples in the dark. Ocean darkness is a unique darkness. There are no street lights. You're surrounded on every side, save the one where the shore is behind you, by an endless black abyss. All you can see is what the moon lets you see, which is scary enough when the waters are calm, but which I would have to imagine is horrifying when the waters are storming and rushing. So just imagine the despair the disciples must have felt and for how long they had to feel it. Did you catch that part? John writes that they had rowed against the sea anywhere from three to four miles for perspective. That would be like taking a paddle boat or a rowboat from here to the post office in Conover. These are scared Weary men fighting against circumstances that they are helpless to change and barely powerful enough to resist. And the governing question is at this point, where is Jesus? Why is he not with them? Why is he occupied with other matters while his disciples are scared to death in a storm that could overtake them at any moment. It's unusual and a little unsettling for Jesus to be absent like this. And equally so for John not to explain the thought process behind Jesus' actions. John, who so often explains Jesus' train of thought, has not done so here. And it's as though he's neglected to do so on purpose. Instead... He intends that we share in the clueless anxiety of the disciples, making their uncertainty our own. He crafts this story in a way that cultivates within us a dreadful sense of Jesus' absence, the sense the disciples themselves would have had. John seems to understand that we will most appreciate Jesus' arrival if we properly experience his perceived absence. So he leaves us in the dark, literally and metaphorically. And as that stress arises within us, as that dread sets in, as those fears reach their peak, then, just then, Jesus appears. See, as the disciples are paddling for their lives, they see a figure approaching walking steadily atop the waters that assailed them. It presses through these mega winds with unwavering stability. And as it emerges from the mist, the disciples realize to their amazement what it is. It's Jesus. Jesus has come for them. And in unimaginable fashion, walking upon the seas, literally treading upon the source of their fears. This is an incredible feat. But be careful to avoid being so caught up in the miracle that you miss the miracle's message. Jesus' actions say something about who he is. See, in Scripture, there is only one who governs the seas. In Genesis 1, verse 2, it's the spirit of the living God that hovers above the face of the waters. 
In Job chapter 9, verse 8, God is proclaimed as the one who treads upon the waves of the seas. God is the one who stays the proud waves. God is the one whose voice the floods are obedient to. God draws out Leviathan with a fish hook. God rules the raging of the sea and stills the rising waves. Jesus has done what we thought God alone could do. And the disciples marvel at this, asking themselves in the synoptic account, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of this story, who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? And as they're considering that among themselves, Jesus draws near and answers their question, saying, I am. Now, some of your Bibles and the translation on the screen, which is the English Standard Version, that's my Bible, have translated that phrase in verse 20, Jesus' identification, as it is I. But that is an example of your Bible translators outthinking the room. Jesus is saying in verse 20, ego a me, which means in its simplest translation, I am. Indeed, this is one of many so-called I am statements in the Gospel of John. And why is that phrase important? What's the significance of that identification? I am, some of you Sunday schoolers might remember, is God's personal, intimate name. It's the name by which he reveals himself to Moses as Israel's savior. savior. He says, when they ask me, who has sent me to deliver, the, to deliver God's people to the promised land? God says, I am who I am. That's who sent you. It's the name before which all of creation bows. It's the name by which God, the creator, eternal God, binds himself to his people in love and in faithfulness like a husband to a wife. I am is God revealing himself in the most intimate terms available. And when Jesus identifies himself as I am to his disciples, he's not just identifying himself. He's identifying himself with the God for whom that name is reserved. He is claiming everything that that name means for himself. He's saying that name is in a way that we can't even begin to comprehend his name. In declaring I am before the disciples, Jesus declares that all of the fullness of God has indwelt him. And he has come to meet the disciples in the midst of their fears. I am, Jesus says, so do not be afraid. And in response to his word, the disciples took him into the boat with gladness, sailing with their Savior until they reached their destination. Do you hear why the disciples are instructed to not be afraid? What was Jesus' rationale there? Is it because the storm had been stilled? Look at the story carefully. John says nothing of the sort. All he says is that Jesus was taken into the boat. And he leaves us to think that the storm persisted until they reached the shore. In other words, and this is important, the disciples' fearful circumstances, at least in that moment, are unchanged, save one significant exception. Almighty God revealed in Christ Jesus, is with them in their troubles. And this is right in line with what Scripture teaches time and again of the effects of God's presence. In Psalm 23, David prays, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Somebody fill in the blanks. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm, in Psalm 16, 11, the psalmist says that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. Paul instructs the Philippians in Philippians 4 to rejoice in all circumstances and be anxious for nothing because the Lord is near. 
And in the opening verses of Psalm 46, the psalm that this passage in John is something of a commentary of, what is it that enables the psalmist to say, Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, it's the fact that God is a very present help in trouble. In trouble, God is not just present. <laughs> I love that language. He's very present. Even amid a ferocious storm, the recognition that in Christ, God himself has become intimately near, turns the disciples' fear into gladness. What storm? But what about you? Let me ask you a question, and it's a vulnerable question. It requires being honest with and about ourselves. What are you afraid of? What fears are you harboring as we speak? Do you find your current experience echoed in that of the disciples? Sure, you're not on a boat. You're not sailing, but you do feel unbalanced, unsteady. You're moving at the pace life is forcing you to move at, and you're worried that you can't keep up much longer. Maybe yours is not a physical darkness no but a spiritual one a metaphorical one you just can't see in front of you there's a formlessness a void to the future with no light to guide you and you're afraid of the dark perhaps others of you are simply tired you're weary you've been paddling against the current for what seems like miles your muscles are failing you. Your spirit failed you much sooner. You're not getting enough sleep, and you dread the inevitable collapse that you know good and well is coming, but you don't know what else to do. The source of our fears vary. It's true. But the result is all the same. A sense of God's absence begins to swell. In our quiet moments, Moments that many of us are determined to avoid. The prayer that's on our hearts, even if we cannot yet bring it to our lips, is, Jesus, I'm scared. Where are you? And in that very moment, when the winds are at their fiercest, when your heart, mind, and body are at their breaking point, and when the devil is afflicting you with feelings of being abandoned by God, and those come from Satan and none other, there, right there, is when God in Christ and by the Spirit is most near you, most present with you. Can you believe that against your unbelief? There are few things that stir a brother to take up for his younger siblings than seeing them afraid. And your fright, your worries, your circumstances that threaten to consume you are a gravitational pull on the heart of Christ. They stir up in Jesus a holy longing to comfort you. And the tenacity of that longing is such that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor power nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation can keep Jesus from coming to you. That wonderful passage from Psalm 139 may as well be speaking of Jesus when it says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is Hebrew for Hades, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light 
to you. Whatever darkness that you're in, it's not thick enough to extinguish his light. However afraid and abandoned you feel, you are, in fact, never alone. A story my dad has passed down to our family is a case in point. A little girl and her mother were living in a safe house. Some of you know what that is. After her mother had left her violent, alcoholic, bully husband, ask anyone who's ever left an abuser. That's actually not as easy as you might think. It's really unfair the way we just ask folks, why don't you just leave? I don't want to trigger anyone's personal trauma, so I'll just say it is an especially awful kind of terror to take one's kid and leave an abusive spouse and parent. But this mother had done so, and she and her daughter were safe. And one evening, one of the night shift volunteers at the house was walking the hallways, making sure that everyone was okay for the night, had everything that they needed, when she heard the little girl singing a song in her room. That song was, you've heard of it, Jesus Loves Me. Now the volunteer knew that this was not a church-going little girl. And she also knew that the girl had not learned this song at the safe house. They were not an explicitly Christian institution. It's a shame that secular institutions do what the church should, but I digress. The volunteer's curiosity got the best of her, and she knocked on the little girl's door. The little girl invited her in, and the volunteer asked, Where did you learn that song? The little girl replied, when my dad would come home late at night and be angry, which was little girl speak for drunk, he would start shouting at my mom and breaking things. And I would get scared and go hide in my closet. And one night, while I was hiding, Jesus came into the closet with me. And he taught me that song. 